Good morning and welcome to the second meeting in 2015 of the Finance Committee of the Scottish Parliament. Could I please remind everyone present to please turn off any mobile phones, tablets or other electronic devices. I would like to welcome to the meeting and indeed to the committee our new member Richard Baker who has replaced his colleague uh, Michael McMahon. Uh, I would like to invite Richard to declare any interests relevant to the remit of the committee. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Convener. I'll simply draw members' attention to my register of interests as a member of the United Union. OK, thank you very much for that. I'd like to remind Richard that the initiation ceremony will be at midnight tonight. We're looking forward to that, super. Yeah, I'll just check my diary with Claire and that'll be fine. Our first item of business uh, this morning is to decide where to take item 7 in private. Are members agreed? Yes. Members have indicated their agreement. Our next item of business is to take evidence on the Community Charge Debt Scotland Bill. This will include two separate evidence sessions. Now, we did intend to have a panel of four witnesses. One has withdrawn before today. Two are late, which is why the committee started ten minutes later than was scheduled. But I'm delighted that Lynn Brown of Glasgow City Council is here, and uh, given the fact that the full brunt of the committee <laughs> will be directed towards you, I will encourage my colleagues to be gentle with you, as I certainly intend to be. Um, members have copies of all the written evidence received, uh, and of course including Glasgow, so uh, without further ado, I'll start with a few questions and then we'll move on to um, uh, open up the session to colleagues around the table and hopefully that uh, uh, other local authority colleagues will arrive before uh, too long. Um, the Glasgow uh, submission is a, a, is, a, is a fairly short but perfectly formed uh, submission. It's less than uh, one page, but there are some important points uh, to it. Um, first of all, in the question which was asked, which is what is your view of the purpose of the bill and broadly are you supportive of it? I have to say there does seem in, in, in political parlance to be what I would call a body swerve in terms of whether or not the city uh, actually supports the bill. So I'd like a wee bit of clarification on, on that, uh, first of all. Um, thank you, Chair, and good morning to the committee. Um, in terms of the response, and I understand you will all have a, a, a copy of that. Um, in, in terms of the, the Council's view on this, is that our whole priority um, over uh, the last, uh, particularly the last 15 years or so, has been to um, maximise our council tax collection levels. Uh -huh. um, and our whole um, debt policy is geared to that. And it's also geared to what we call breaking the cycle of debt. So you'll have seen in the figures that are in part of the information at this committee that our actual levels of, kind of community charge collection are relatively low because we are very much focused on collecting our council tax, um, and that would be the issue for us. Okay, so I'm still not really sure if Glasgow thinks the bill is a good idea or not. So. The council has not taken a formal position on it, um, uh, through committee, for example, um, and as I said, we are very much focused on uh, helping the current taxpayers. Much for that. Um, we've just been joined uh, by uh, Councillor Kevin uh, Keenan of COSLA and also by uh, Gregory Colgan of Dundee City Council, both of whom were delayed, no doubt, because of the appalling weather conditions. So welcome uh, to the committee. It was just the first question that I asked, and it was basically, um, I just asked uh, Lynn whether Glasgow was supportive of, of the bill, and you would have heard her response uh, there. Um, I, I'm just wondering, uh, basically, uh, I wonder if you can... I'll just see whether or not uh, um, what COSLA's broad view is actually, um, because we don't have a submission obviously from COSLA, uh, Mr Keenan, so I'm quite keen to... First of all, please accept my apology for being late. The weather uh, is, is, it's been a bit severe over the last few days in Dundee and God normally just puts rays of sunshine on Dundee, as you all well know. Uh, the, the, I suppose COSLA's uh, real issue is that they, they didn't particularly see the need for legislation. Uh, and obviously, as, as, as regards the bill, and the, the write-off of the debt, as, 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 as agreed, uh, d don't particularly, uh, or, or they've got some concerns as to whether there's any additional consequences with individuals that feel uh, they've uh, paid their tax in good faith, and here we are now some years later with individuals that didn't pay, wouldn't pay, having their debt written off for them. Uh, so there's some concern there. And as to whether there's a legislation that has any other uh, consequence, uh, hence the reason that COSLA was not overly supportive of feeling the need for legislation. 
And Mr. Colgan, I mean, in Dundee's submission, you say, and I quote, in communicating the bill to the public, it's important this does not send out a message which is linked to non-payment of older council tax debt, which is still being pursued. Dundee City Council has a strong track record of collecting prior year's council tax. I just wonder if you can expand on that a wee bit and tell us what concerns you actually have in that regard. I think, um, reflecting the submission, the, the concern the council um, would have would be that um, with the bill, um, it, should it go through, that um, individuals think that it's acceptable not to pay historic council tax debt and something similar may happen in the future. So um, with um, our current corporate debt policy, obviously what we aim to do is break the debt link. Um, and our focus is obviously on current council tax um, with um, any arrangements then going to prior council tax and subsequently community tax debt. But we would hope that individuals would still um, pay and continue to work with the council um, to ensure that arrangements are um, fair and we can work with them to recover council tax and also um, break the links to um, future debt and poverty. Uh, yeah, so yeah, in, in that regard, your, your comments were very similar to Glasgow's. Um, I just um, one thing which I thought was interesting, um, uh, um, Ms. Brown, in terms of your own um, submission again, was that uh, based on the figures for Glasgow, the council doesn't believe the peak in voter registration recorded ahead of September 2014 can be attributed to people with community charge debt re-engaging after a quarter of a century. <coughs> and of course, that's important because that's obviously what, what, one of the, the reasons given for bringing forward this uh, piece of legislation. Again, can you, uh, I know you've, you've given me a submission, but I'm just wondering for the record if you can give us a bit more information on Glasgow's thinking on that and what Glasgow um, believes. Um, was it was the reason for um, so many people engaging who had not been on the register for years? And in terms of our register, um, we have made it a priority, particularly since 2009, to um, increase the register in Glasgow. So, for example, in 2009, 89% people were registered that you would expect to be registered. And by uh, September 2014, that was 97.4%. Um, However, um, between September 2013 and t September 2014, we had an increase of about 2.5%. It was about 11,000 uh, uh, voters, and 10,000 of those were 16 to 17-year-olds. So it's our view that until then, people were engaged in the process. They were registering, um, even if um, they may have had um, community charge debt. So for us, the last big surge was really around, for Glasgow, and our figures um, uh, show that was for the 16, 17 year olds, which we had a very high level of registration. Thank you for that. Now, now Councillor Keenan, I know you, you don't have this submission before us, but uh, uh, we've got a number of submissions, obviously, um, from other organisations and member organisations of COSLA. Um, the Director of Finance of Highland Council commented on the potential for what he called was unintended consequences. Is there any unintended consequences that COSLA are concerned about with regard to this legislation? I think the unintended That's a hair pitch voice for me. Uh, I think the unintended consequences are, you know, do people consider that someone's going to come along and write off debt that they have at the moment? And I think that the answer that uh, Mr. Colgan just gave you in relation to Dundee's concerns are very much that as well. You know, as, as you know, people are seeing pressures on their home budget. Uh, and, and their living standards as they are at the moment. And I think that, you know, if we could get away with not paying a bill, then ch chances are that would be the case. I think the unintended consequences are, would it affect the collection levels that we have at the moment? Uh, or whether, uh, you know, because we wouldn't want to see them get any, any worse, considering the pressures that local government are under uh, with finance at the moment. Osla appear to have accepted the full financial settlement of £869,000 provided by um, the Scottish Government. That was done the 21st of November. Um, so is that, um, is your view that that's a fair settlement? You know, because... The information that was causally was requested and the figures that came in, from a causally point of view, I think that uh, we see that as a fair settlement. These are the figures that were asked for and these were the figures that were achieved. It seems to me that, um, um, Ms Brown, that um, 
you've said that um, it's our understanding that the calculation of the financial settlement reflects amounts intimated to cause from individual councils as to the impact of the bill. But I'm surprised at that because Glasgow City Council um, is only getting like 2.3% uh, of this settlement figure. But when you actually look at the amount of money that's actually owed, um, you know, Glasgow City Council, 29.4% is actually owed in Glasgow, £125 million, and yet the settlement figure is £20,000. What's Glasgow's view? I was surprised that Glasgow seemed to be quite happy with the COSLA settlement figure. Um, we give a, a figure for the city, for ourselves, and that reflects the payment arrangements we have in place. I think it's about two to 3000 a year that we get in through actual existing payment arrangements for community charge. Um, and that, um, those payment arrangements now being um, set aside as such would, between, I think we said 10 to 20,000, and I think COSLA have gone in with a higher figure of 20. In terms of um, the debt outstanding, um, as we said, our, our policy, I mean, um, since council tax has come in, is to focus on that. Um, when council tax come in, the level of payment in Glasgow on uh, reflecting the community charge was about 70%. Uh, so about 30 percent and that figure you'll have seen i think of 125 million really reflects 30 percent non-payment um over time of community charge um, and we really focused hard in getting our collection levels they were at 73 percent in 1996 up to nearly uh, the 94 percent line council tax also um in terms of resources that you would put into following up on community charge um it, it is really time consuming and costly um so we focused on the current council tax and really to encourage people to start paying tax again because there, there had um, developed a sort of um, process of non-payment in Glasgow and that has been reversed. Yes, I remember the Glasgow campaign. Um, Mr Keenan, um, you know, um, the financial memorandum says, and I quote, recovery of much of the state is now prevented by both practical considerations <laughs> and by the law of prescription. It, so... It, how do you feel then? Do you feel that this is something that we really should be drawing a line under or do you, would you share the view of North Lanarkshire Council which says, and I quote, the collecting authority, in this case local authority, should be empowered to use all available information and means to seek collection? I mean, I think individual authorities have, uh, have, will continue to talk for themselves. I mean, obviously, because they are happy to accept the agreement as it stands, uh, obviously, we made the, the reference, we didn't think there was a need for legislation and you know, and again, obviously, the potential for uh, the, the sort of un, unintended consequences. In, in general terms, people are uh, were happy to accept the, the offer that was made. Just get one final question, and I'll open the session out. Um, and it's just to go back to the thing again about the settlement. Um, um, Mr. Colgan Dundee is getting 35.1% of the settlement figure, but it's only 2.6% of the outstanding uh, debt. How did you manage to wangle that? Uh, said me to negotiate it. <laughs> um, the, the figures then provided by um, Dundee Council to COSLA reflect the um, current arrangements and current um, income which um, the Council are receiving for um, arrangements which are in place to community charge. Um, albeit those figures have reduced, um, we still anticipate to collect around £60,000 um, a year over the next five years um, relating to community charge, and that is arrangements which are currently in place. Thank you for that. I'm now going to open up the session. The first person to ask a question will be a deputy convener. Uh, to be followed by Mark. John. Thanks, convener, very much. I mean, just to maybe follow up on that point, that's quite interesting that Dundee is you're getting quite a lot of money in. I mean, was that is that something that's been constant throughout, or have you put in a lot of effort in recently? And, and can you maybe explain to us, is that through like earnings arrestments, or how's the money actually coming in? Um, the, the, the value of um, income which we've received for the community charge has reduced over, over the, the last five years. Um, in 2019, it was around 150,000, and it's reduced to to currently 60,000. Um, those arrangements are arrangements which are, are ongoing um, and are mostly relating to people who are, who are paying um, a sum of money um, towards the debt. Um, there are very few which are in relation to earnings assessment. I mean, Ms Brown, can, can you say well, why is Glasgow different? Had we tried harder earlier or are Glasgow people just more reluctant to pay or is there a difference there? Um, we... Um, in terms of community charge, um, since 2004, we've taken in about a million pounds in community charge, um, and that has 
um, reduced over the last three or four years. So we're at around about two to three thousand, um, because people have paid off their debt and there's some remaining. I think it's because our focus really is on on the council tax and and breaking that cycle of debt, um, and that's where our focus has been. Still paying? Are they coming in and paying cash, or is it coming off their wages or off their benefits, or can you tell us? I have that detail here, um, Mr. Mason. Um, uh, in terms of the payment arrangements that they that they have uh, for the number of people, I can provide that. I don't have that level of breakdown here today. Just wonder. That's fine. So, I mean, has the is the problem both for Glasgow and Dundee or anywhere else for that matter that? Um, you know, we haven't known where the people were. So there's people out there with lots of money that could be paying it. and But now that with the voter registration, potentially we could have found out where they were. Or is the reality that most of the, that money is owed by people who, who have no money and, and there's very little chance of them paying it at all? Anyone? <laughs> all, all of these are, 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 you know, potential, uh, you know, individuals that didn't pay, uh, and, and many years ago decided that they would take themselves on any off any kind of voter registration because they didn't want to be tracked down to pay. Probably didn't have the money at the time to pay either. Individuals that are were in employment, uh, good prospects, one of their occupiers uh, or, or whatever uh, had a different scenario. Uh, and I know individuals that said at the time that they wouldn't pay, and they paid up uh, eventually. Uh, and, and these are the type of individuals that are unhappy with the fact that there is a debt being written off for someone else. Uh, but I mean, that, again, is a, a, a potential un unintended consequence. See, I came through in the train this morning with somebody who hadn't paid to start with, then did pay, but also fully supported the, the you know, felt that this was the right thing. I mean, do you, th do you think there was potential with the new voters to really start get a lot more money in from the community charge if we'd pursued that? I think it's hard to tell what type of voter has turned up. Uh, that type of uh, um, breakdown of what age groups and whatever uh, would be, be the one. I think you asked that one of uh, earlier in Glasgow and they're unable to say what are the individuals that turned up. You know, is it of an age group? Uh, that have been away for 20-odd years or off the electoral roll for 20-odd years, is it new individuals coming on, 16-year-olds, uh, you know, off an age coming in to vote for the first time? These are the unknowns to, to us. I don't have that uh, level of breakdown that would suggest it's all based on uh, a historic debt that we've seen people coming on. That people obviously may well want to see change, uh, and hence the reason they signed up, or, you know, there was just that level of campaigning going on they felt they wanted to be a part of it. Let's hope that that continues. I don't know if either, do either the other two want to comment on that, yes? Yeah. Um, um, for us, as I said, the voter registration, registration has been increasing um, since 2009 uh, when community charge was in place. And for Glasgow, the increase was 16, 17-year-olds. I think the difference was the voter turnout, um, which was much higher. But the actual voting registration had been increasing regularly since 2009. Um, I, I mean, there has been this issue, which I think the, the convener already referred to, that um, you know, if people get into the habit of just not paying something and then hopefully eventually it will go away, um, that could knock on to the council tax. I suppose the counter-argument to that is, well, ev almost everybody thought the poll tax was a bad idea, apart from Mr Brown, obviously. And um, the, uh, whereas people think the council tax we can kind of live with, do you think people make that differentiation, or do you think there is a real danger that we could go down the road of this will actually put people off paying council tax? I think there's many changes coming in the direction of people's household budgets. Uh, you know, and, and, and individuals on benefits have seen a bedroom tax introduced. Uh, there's a lot more uh, individual pressures on individual households. Uh, there's food banks now that you know, uh, and there's a lot of. There's a lot of reason to believe that people are struggling, uh, and I think that that in itself may have people of the opinion, well, that might be one uh, that we'll be able to walk away from, or that'll be a debt that we'll be able to walk away from, and hence the reason that we believe there could be that level of uh, consequential loss to council, uh, should that, that be the case. I wouldn't like to see it, because obviously there's a lot of vital services delivered by council. And, and that would be the message that I would be trying to put out to people, was please pay, uh, because these are the services that it delivers for you and your community. 
think my final question, and it, this may be not one that you can answer, but do, do you know how, if we take, say, like the utility companies or shops, when they're pursuing debt, how, how long they go on pursuing it? Would it be 20 years as well, or do they go on for longer? Or Have you any idea about that? That's maybe an unfair question. Yeah, I've not got any uh, great amount of debt that I know of. Uh, so, you know, I'm probably the wrong person to ask, but I mean, sure, those organisations could... Uh, get closer to giving you a good answer on that. Has anybody else, else any idea? Not, not, that wouldn't be your area of expertise, I assume. Yes? And, um, in Glasgow, um, we spend about three and a half million a year on um, financial advice through law centres, money advice and citizen advice bureaus. And our experience is people um, do not like being in debt. Um, it causes um, mental um, health issues as well as other issues. Um, and that's why we invest in those services to support them. Um, so um, I can't comment on utility companies, etc. But I know that in Glasgow, it's not taken lightly um, getting into debt. Okay, Mark. Before by Jean. Um, th thank you, convener. Um, I note that uh, the comment was made around the possibility of establishment of precedent in terms of. If this debt is written off, it could um, give the impression that other debts would be treated similarly. For example, council tax debt was referred to. A note from a um, number of tables that have been provided to the committee by the Parliament's Information uh, Centre um, that 10 local authorities have ceased collection uh, of community charge debt. Now, presumably, they've had to square that circle locally. Has any information been sought by local authorities or by COSLA from those councils around the impact that their decision locally to cease collection had in regard to council tax debt and how they squared the circle that has been uh, suggested by um, some of our witnesses. COSLA is not trying to gather that kind of information as to what effect non-collection or a decision uh, not to collect in an area would have had, obviously, we respect the fact that individual local authorities make the decisions in their area but that best suit the individuals that they represent. Uh, as the, and that's how we operate as an organisation. Uh, I suppose for Dundee, uh, as much as uh, being, being a, a council that's always seen itself among the higher of uh, um, value to, or the higher, not value, but the higher cost to council tax uh, and uh, has always tried to pursue the debt. We've got a press uh, in the area that, and individuals in the area that obviously would put council under pressure to make sure that outstanding debt is, is looked at and tried to gather up a, a fully uh, in agreement with what was said from Glasgow or uh, Lynn there in relation to, I don't think people like being in debt. Uh, I think it adds another pressure on them and uh, local authorities do what they can to make sure that people don't build it. Uh, unfortunately, though, some people don't engage in it, Thomas. don't know if either of the local authority... Have we have any other local authority um, on the matter. OK. Uh, I, I note, um, again, the figures in terms of the uh, income from community charge collection that we've been provided with, and they do show quite dramatic tail-offs in some local authorities, Glasgow being the, the one that stands out where £550,000 was collected in 2003-04 to £2,000 in 2013-14. Uh, I'd be interested to explore a little bit further. You, you mentioned about the costly process that's involved. I mean, is Glasgow in a position where essentially it's spending more in terms of pursuit of community charge and administering collection of com community charge than it's actually taking in on an annual basis? And we are taking in around £3,000, um, but they are payment arrangements, so the actual administration cost is very low for that. Um, uh, so that sort of evens itself out as such. As I said, you've mentioned the figures from 2003-04. That's when we decided to have to look at our debt policy and to focus on council tax and to help people break that debt, and those figures reflect that. Okay. Um, and then also to look then at the, the, the breakdowns of total uncollected community charge, and obviously that's the total sum that goes uncollected. Is there a, 
a relevant figure that is held by the local authority in terms of the likely recoverable community charge, um, because obviously um, th I would imagine some of that debt is held against people who you just don't have any idea where they are, and therefore at present it's it's not debt you could realistically say was recoverable. Um, do, do you hold similar figures uh, in either local authority of the total amount that is owed versus the total amount that you could reasonably assume to collect? Um, it, the, how you would show that is through your, your accounts, where you'd have a, a provision for that collection, and 2003 4 again, we decided to write that down and focus on council tax. So um, we don't reflect that in our books. Mr. Colby? Dundee. Okay. Um, and, and just uh, finally, a number of submissions have spoken about the uh, existence of sporadic and informal payments. So where you have formal payment arrangements at present, uh, where individuals, you know that you're going to get that income, um, there is the potential, it is argued, for individuals to arrive at the door of the council, if you will, and say, I'm here to clear my community charge debt. Um, there's been an argument that that should be factored in in terms of the, the way that the settlement has been calculated. Do you see any realistic way that that could be calculated? Or indeed, is it a, a, a method that you think ought to be used by the Scottish Government uh, when it's coming to the calculation of the settlement? Dundee, um, as reflected in our submission, we, we believe the settlement to um, be um, a fair settlement. Um, I think it would be extremely difficult, um, particularly for Dundee Council, to in any way estimate what the likelihood of sporadic payments um, would be for individuals who may appear in the scenario which I've outlined. Would that be the same from Glasgow? Same for Glasgow, yes. Okay. Thanks, Camino. Jean to be followed by Gavin. I wanted to ask um, maybe about putting the debt in context in, uh, in as much as comparing with other debts. I mean, I've been a councillor and I know that at the end of the year there's a, a other, other debts that are written off because the council have decided for whatever reason, different reasons, that they're just never, no matter how much money they throw at sheriff officers or anybody else, they're simply just not going to get uh, be paid. So is... Is in in context of outstanding debt that councils have, is the poll tax element uh, massive? Is it the largest part of the debt? Is it the biggest debt that you that 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 uh, is outstanding in councils? Um, because it's been written out of the books, there's no figure sitting on the books, which is the issue to do with debt. Um, you know, do, do you have a, uh, can you uh, get that money back? So, and as I said, it's been written out of the books in Glasgow, um, uh, 2003. So there's no comparison as such. Uh, though that 100, and f I think it's 125 million for Glasgow is a significant figure, but that is not sitting on our books. And do you think that that's the same for, for most councils? Do we know from... Uh, the, our position again is that the, the debt is not um, sitting on the books um, and again going back to um, our submission our focus would be on council tax debt so to provide that analysis in terms of the um, proportion of which the community charge relates versus other individual debts that would be a quite an extremely difficult task um, to do but certainly Dundee's position would be the same as Glasgow that the debt um, is not reflected within the um, within the books. So I, I think we could probably fairly assume that that will be the case for every council that in, in, in essence as far as the annual accounts are concerned that the, that the, the poll tax will have in effect, been written off. I can't comment on other councils, um, but I just can't comment on their books. The difference between England, one of the things that was thrown up, I, th I remember at the time um, of the, the fear of suddenly people registering to vote and then being challenged uh, or chased up for poll tax that was highlighted was the difference between England and Scotland, and we seem to pursue debt for a longer time. I mean, do you feel that this merits legislation or there could be some kind of amnesty um, that put in context might be even more agreeable 
to the people who feel a bit aggrieved that, you know, they somehow uh, uh, were good citizens and have paid their bill and look what happens if you don't bother. I think that's the... I think the fear is that, that that's where it gets to. And, you know, obviously in local government that's hard-pressed for finance, uh, then I think we look towards maximising the income that we have uh, and clearly we look towards other ways of trying to maximise our income that we've got, you know, seen any kind of debt written off and, and we wouldn't want to see the wrong message being sent out to individuals. So that, that, that's, a, that's a bit of a fear. It's, it's an unknown at the moment. We'll just have to uh, see what that pans out like over a period of time. But I suppose if you're reducing the number of years that uh, you, you live with the, the consequence of holding the debt, with the knowing that it falls off the end of the plate somewhere, uh, then that would be another goal for some individuals as they may not wish to pay things. Rather than, I know that w one or two of the, of the uh, evidence papers that we've got from other councils are saying that it, 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 it doesn't merit legislation. I just wonder what, if you have a view about that, if, there's, if you feel that there's a way that we could be going forward with this without legislation and still writing off the poll tax debt. The, the agreement's there. Councils have agreed to accept the deal that's done with government. As, as far as I'm concerned, it's forgotten now. Uh, but, you know, as to whether there's need for legislation, uh, there was a concern at COSLA that, that, that it's an unnecessary uh, and, and they wouldn't want to see any legislation that affected uh, anything else. And COSLA agreed to work with the Scottish Government to make sure that hopefully that wouldn't happen. Uh, but perhaps uh, an unnecessary part of parliamentary time. Thank you. Thank you. Gavin, to be followed by Richard. Um, I mean, a number of uh, witnesses giving written evidence have made the point about uh, trying not to link it to older payment of council tax and, and uh, putting their, their concerns about that. Dundee, in your submission, say specifically it's important that this does not send out a message which is linked to non payment of older council tax debt, which is still being pursued. Um, what, what has been the government response to though that, that issue being raised? Councillor, I'm unaware of that. But, uh, I'm not sure there's been any response. Um, so, as to whether the Director of Finance received anything, I'm unaware, but we could check it out and see whether she has. If anybody it's possible that has been. I mean, has Dundee had a formal response to that? I know. Formal response being received by Dundee City Council. And, I mean, I know Glasgow didn't specifically raise that in the, the written evidence here, but are you, are you aware of any response to that concern that has been raised by a few councils? Um, my understanding that is that is part of why we are here in front of the committee today, so the committee can assess that, and sure. that would be part of the government's response, is my understanding. Okay, sure. All right. Um, secondly, in relation to... Mark, Mark McDonald raised the issue. He referred to a paper we've been given by the, the Information Centre, um, it's page 16, but I don't know if you have the document, but it, if, if you don't, it doesn't matter too much. He, he asked the question about how much of that, of that debt is realistic, realistically recoverable. I want to ask a slightly different question, um, and it's to do with prescription, because if you take, we'll just take Dundee, for example, just because obviously you're here. According to the table, uncollected community charge as of 31st of March last year for Dundee City, uh, just over £11 million. Pounds. Um, now, you're not sure how much of that is recoverable or not, fair enough. Um, but that, that is the uncollected charge. What I'm wondering is, is, is some of that £11 million invalid due to prescription, or is, or is that likely to be the figure having ig ignored the stuff that has fallen due to prescription? I mean, is, I'm guessing, is, it, is the £11 million, while it not be a realistic collection figure, is it actually a legally due figure, or has prescription actually um, meant that that £11 million figure is should be reduced anyway. Do, do you know about that? For Dundee City Council, the £11 million reflects the, the value at the end of March 2014, which remains uncollected. None of that debt has prescribed because the Council took a decision to, um, to warrant that debt, so all that debt at present is still collectible under a valid summary warrant. Okay, so on, on an annual basis, then, Dundee's position, anyways, you, each year you would, you would um, suggest a certain amount has actually prescribed and therefore it shouldn't be 
included in that figure? And that, that in itself would be a difficult task to determine that value because um, none of the, the debt at present is prescribed. Um, and if an individual were to make contact with us, then the summary warrant would then start from that point. Yes. So 20 years of un uninter uninterrupted acknowledgement. Okay. And is that, I mean, is that the same for Glasgow? Yes, that would be the same. Okay. Um, the next question then, in terms of the, I mean, obviously this process has happened fairly swiftly. I mean, the first, uh, I think, public pronouncement was the 2nd of October. Um, and we're already looking at the, I guess, the this, this stage one process here, or just in advance of the stage one process. What has been the process of engagement with government over the um, objectives of the bill? I mean, obviously, there was no formal consultation, but the government are saying in their um, policy memorandum and explanatory notes that there has been um, quite a lot of engagement. What, what has been the nature of that engagement and how, what sort of depth of discussions have they had with either COSLA or or your individual councils? The conversation and uh, coming up with a settlement and reaching an agreement is taking, uh, this meeting is taking longer than that particular conversation had. I mean, obviously, the First Minister at the time made an announcement uh, that he was going to do it. Uh, COSLA broadly in agreement. Uh, the, there's been a canvassing of uh, individual authorities as to what that debt was. And, and then we had uh, a meeting with uh, Derek Mackay and his officers, uh, myself, I think it was David O'Neill from uh, the, the president of COSLA and uh, our officers of COSLA, and we agreed that that was the settlement figure, is that is that what individual councillors, uh, individual councils uh, seen as the debt that, based on the criteria they were asked for, was where it was. So the conversation has not been great uh, or enormous with government. Has been accepted. So that was the direction of travel. Just, just for clarity, though, I mean, you, you you said a fairly short period of time, uh, shorter than this meeting, for agreeing the amount. But in terms of engagement over the policy objectives of the bill and potential unforeseen consequences, some of which have come out today, what what level of discussion and um, took place with government on that? There, there seemed to be an acceptance that if there was an unforeseen circumstance that we would be back round the table having some level of negotiation as to the way forward if, if that had a, a negative effect on the collection of uh, council tax uh, then we would be back looking for support from government to make sure uh, that we were able to pay our bills. Government, uh, they, they have underwritten that effectively. I, I believe that the, the agreement was that we would uh, uh, get back round the table should that happen. You know, we, we obviously raised the fact that there, there would be individuals uh, uh, and individuals groups may well form and say in good faith we paid uh, where's your discount are you giving us some money back uh, you know but we'll wait and see whether these things happen I know that there's been noise in, in the press but you know, I'm not sure that council have, have had anything presented to them as yet um, I mean, is that in terms of discussion or engagement with the government, is that is that similar to for, for your two individual councils, or was it was it all done through COSLA, to your knowledge? To my knowledge, it was done through COSLA. And to my knowledge, it was all done through COSLA. Um, la last issue, then, just to explore is the. I think you've given. I mean, Dundee are obviously uh, not unhappy with the, the numbers as such as uh, the convener alluded to. Um, point that's come through some of the papers, but I don't think either of, of your individual papers, but you may wish to comment on it. Um, other papers, they're saying the, the, val the amounts agreed reflect what were existing arrangements at the time of the information being given. Uh, some councils or some uh, witnesses, not all of course, have said actually that was a position of existing arrangements, but actually because of the information we have now, um, electoral rules specifically, actually there's a possibility that we could have uh, collected higher. They don't put figures on it, but we could have collected more um, and therefore actually the figures should be uh, increased to reflect that. I just wonder if, if um, either COSA or either of your councils have a view on that. Are there, are there um, arrangements that actually could have been set up if this uh, bill hadn't been brought forward that would have increased the um, amounts collected? For us, the as I said, our electoral register has been increasing. Um, since 2009, our major increase is 16, 17-year-olds who would not be impacted by this, so we did not see the link. This was Dundee's collection rate was, was 
relatively high anyway. Was, did you see that? Was there scope for a greater collection based on the electoral roll, or was it was that de minimis? Dundee Council um, didn't see any potential scope for increasing the collection within community charge due to the electoral register information. I think some councils uh, in intimated to Cosler that they felt that there was other ways where they uh, were achieving an income, albeit it might not have been enormous, but you know, based on the criteria we asked for and information gathered, these are the figures that Cosler dealt with. And I'm not sure if these individual councillors are our councils are overly unhappy uh, because it wasn't uh, a debt that uh, individuals had paid up and agreed that they were going to say there are other means of pursuing that debt uh, which were not accounted for here. Okay. Thanks, Governor. Thank to be followed by Malcolm. Uh, thank you, Governor. I'll turn briefly to the, the issue of um, process Mr Brown raised because whatever the merits of the of the policy here, I mean, um, Councillor Kinnan, you said that there's been questions over whether, whether legislation is the right way, right way to progress it. So before the um, announcement was made that the Scottish Government were going to introduce this as a bill, I mean, prior to that announcement, was there any consultation with, with COSLA about that proposal? To my knowledge, I think Cosler received the phone call five minutes before an announcement was made, or maybe five minutes after the announcement was made, to say this is what was likely to happen. Uh, so there wasn't a, any level of consultation about this as a direction of travel that uh, the Scottish Government or Cosler felt that they needed to go. I think, you know, just the record, I think that, you know, whatever the merits of, of, of this process, whatever the policies, I think that on the consultation level that's... Uh, deeply unsatisfactory. But um, returning to just the, some of the, 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 the graphs we have in the table we have on financial data, uh, Mr. MacDonald made the point that um, in, in the case of a number of local authorities in the years from you know, 2003 to 2010, it was quite a lot of collection of debt. And then after that, it fell off quickly. Now, is it fair to say that's because of issues of practicality rather than policy decisions by councils of whatever political complexion, not to collect that debt? Was it, or, or was it actually a policy decision? Or do you have a kind of overview of, what, of, 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 why, of the main driver for why um, councils stopped collecting de debt, certainly in, to the extent that they had been? I think from um, Dundee's perspective, um, to my knowledge, it would be to the, the, the change um, in focus, moving to um, a corporate approach to recovery and focus, focusing um, that um, process on breaking the debt cycle and um, for payments and arrangements which were coming in, focusing them towards current year payments um, and also due to arrangements that may have been in place for community charge that had come to an end. So, the, but the driver was collecting debt in a different way or dealing with debts in a different way rather than saying we're going to give up chasing this debt at all? Yes, that would be my assumption. Question, um, convener, is um, how many local authorities have up to this point been using information from the electoral register to chase up outstanding community charge debt? I mean, ha has it been happening routinely? Uh, are many local authorities doing it, or is this just an issue which came up with the referendum? Any of uh, have been particularly using it, but we haven't been doing that in Glasgow, and I can't comment on other councils. Now, they haven't been using that information in terms of community charge debt? No. And pre presumably, actually, the vast majority of local authorities have not been um, using that uh, I, I electoral registration information to, to actually, as part of their policy in terms of pursuing corporate debt. When you look at the figures that have been, been produced, um, quite a lot of councils have stopped pursuing the debt, so I assume that yeah. is the case. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, Ma Malcolm? I hadn't really heard of the law of prescription until this came up, and I'm not entirely sure if I totally understand how it works now, but, I mean, Gavin Brown's covered some of this already. But are you, is it true that all the figures that are being presented uh, uh, is all debt that could legally be collected uh, so that there isn't uh, any of it that would be covered by the law of prescription? From Dundee's point of view, the, the, the figures that are given there, I think Greg suggested it was about a five-year figure on the current level that we're collecting on agreements that are in place. Uh, Dundee's uh, debt, I think, was, was uh, I think for some of the figures I got when we were having that discussion with uh, uh, Derek Mackay, was that I was surprised that Dundee only looked for 300,000. I thought we'd be looking for a lot more. 
having had discussions with uh, uh, finance officers and director of finance, uh, I can understand how that figure was reached. Uh, I thought it would have been a, a much higher figure, but except that, you know, over that period of time, individuals or that debt will be finished for some, uh, and you know, uh, you know, the, the the length of time becomes difficult to continue. Except that you're going to get that level year on year. I display my ignorance of the law of prescription here, but if somebody disappeared from the electoral register in 1991 and then suddenly appeared again in 2014 i mean would it be possible to recover from them if if no you know if they just disappeared for that length of time or would, i mean I, I would i mean if if no approach had been made to them in that time because they disappeared from the register would, would that not be covered by the law of prescription or am i misunderstanding it certainly from 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 to my knowledge um it would be dependent on when the summary warrant um was taken out um, and whether or not there had been contact from the date the summary warrant was granted um, within that 20-year period. So that's a 23-year period? Yeah. It would depend when, the, for some dates, the dates may have been re-warranted. You know, it's just that that came up when, I, when the bill was introduced and people were talking about this, but I, I just wonder practically whether it's it's very relevant to, to this debate or not, or should we just forget about it? ...missing for 23 years, uh, that it's not made any contact with Council whatsoever, and there's no been any kind of warrant in place or, or whatever, then the chances of uh, ever making any pursuit of that is uh, it's not going to happen. Of course, in the discussion of the bill, the law of prescription got mixed up in some people's minds with the situation in England, where my understanding is debts are written off after 10 years, so I think that was something brought in by the last Labour government. I can't remember what the reason for it was, and it was English only legislation, so I had no reason to know. But, Ted, does anybody see any virtue in us copying the English approach in terms of a time limit for all debt owed to councils? If, if the Scottish government's going to stump up the money, and uh, you know, but... I'm, I'm not sure that you've got the finance even with the underspend to make that level happen. Okay, thank, you. thank you very much. Um, one of the jobs I have as convener is to do this kind of sweeper role as well and ask a, any questions that maybe haven't been asked uh, by colleagues around the table. So I've just got a couple really, a lot of more of my questions are going to be for the Cabinet Secretary. But the first question I'd like to ask is, I mean, we keep hearing about this £425.3 million, which is outstanding. Um, is that £425 million a cash figure, or has it been increased to take into account inflation over the years, or is that the actual sum of money that's owed? Do you, do you know what the position is on that? Is there interest? The finance people here. My understanding is that community charge is made up of a number of things, including surcharges, and I understand that figure reflects the total cash that would be, avail would be due um, as at the date it was um, given. Understanding as well, actually. I just wanted clarification on that. But the other thing I was going to ask is how realistic is, uh, how real is this debt? Because over 20 odd years, a lot of the people who will have owed this money will have simply passed away. Um, a lot of them will have emigrated or moved to other parts of the United Kingdom or whatever. Uh, so how much of it is actually real in terms of recoverable because the people are A, still alive and B, living in a Scottish local authority? Um, is there any assessment being made of that, do we know, eh, Kevin, from Hosler's point of view? I don't think there's any assessment, but I think that you know, if some councils have acted differently and Dundee's kept the focus on it, then there's no reason to believe that other councils shouldn't have had a similar figure uh, to, in relation to what Dundee, especially if you're looking at uh, you know, trying to judge up what the areas of multiple deprivation would be, you would have expected uh, Glasgow to be really <coughs> fast for a, a much higher figure than Dundee's obviously agreed to settle on. Only bringing in just over 0.5 percent of what's owed, so it's not really big bucks, really. If you think about the money that's that's allegedly owed on paper, you know. But of course, as I said, somebody might have died in 1995, and they're still effectively uh, classed as having um, owed that. The other thing I was going to say is, what uh, do you know? Just how much is is um, is being uh, spent on collection at the moment? I mean, for example, Dundee, how much are you spending to collect this? £60,000, because I think it's quite interesting. I mean, we're looking at £327,000 coming in, but I'm wondering how much has actually been spent collecting that. 327000 I think that must have a significant impact on the fact that 10 local authorities have just decided not to bother 
Do we know how much it's costing? Exact figure for um, the cost of collection in relation to community charge. It will not be a high figure, but there will be some resource that will go into collecting um, the, the figure, which is um, estimated to be £60,000 for this year, but I don't have the exact figure with me um, today. I appreciate uh, Linda, what you said about Glasgow earlier on, about the fact that Glasgow is focusing on ensuring the council taxes is being paid, but it's one of the reasons why Glasgow is not really pursuing this, is the cost of pursuit? Or what's it's, it's, a it's the cost and the practicality because of the time. Um, the arrangements we have in place have just sort of run themselves. The cost is very minimal. Okay. And this, I've got is there any overall figure, uh, Kevin, any, any kind of ballpark figure about what it's costing per pound brought in? I mean, I, I see that, you know, I, I, I mean, I would doubt very much whether any council has got an army of individuals that's solely focused on trying to bring this in. And even from the point of view of Dundee, I mean, as a local councillor in Dundee, I would be saying, why have we got that army of people? You know, a long time ago, we would have forgot about uh, you know, the collection if it was costing an arm and a leg to collect it. You know, the, the fact is we have a number of people that work in debt recovery, have a number of individuals that go out and support and try to get people out of debt uh, and, and guide them through, uh, you know, for welfare reform, uh, uh, welfare rights individuals, citizens' advice, and a number of other agencies in the city were focused well on that, uh, like other authorities have done to try to make sure that uh, we guide through people through the debt and make sure that we, we get them out of it, look for ways to maximise their income as well, uh, which is obviously important too. But, you know, we haven't got an army of people across uh, local government collecting and focusing on a debt that's 20-odd year old. It's, it's agreements that are in place and that trickles in, albeit a small amount. Uh, I'm just about to draw the, uh, the session to a close. I just wonder if, if any of our witnesses have got any further points they want to bring to the attention of committee. Aren't you all happy? OK, well, well, I'd like to thank you very much for coming today, particularly in the appalling weather. Uh, we really do appreciate you, you actually coming to committee today, so thank you uh, very much for that. I'm going to call a recess until 10.40 just to allow members to have a natural break and allow a changeover of witnesses.
our consideration of the community charge debt Scotland Bill by taking evidence from uh, John Swinney, uh, Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Constitution and Economy. The Cabinet Secretary is accompanied for this item by Scottish Government officials, uh, Jenny Brough, Graham Owenson, Laurie Barry and Colin Brown. And I welcome our witnesses uh, to the meeting today and I'd like to invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Convener. On the 2nd of October last year, the former First Minister announced the Government's intention to bring forward legislation to ensure that councils can take no further action to recover ancient community charge or poll tax debts. With the cooperation of the parliamentary authorities, we have been able to bring legislation forward on an expedited timetable so that the legislation can be enforced for the start of the next financial year. As a result, our proposals have not been the subject to full public consultation, but we have consulted with COSLA and local authorities, who are the only bodies that could be adversely affected by our proposals. Informed by that consultation, the financial settlement the Scottish Government will make to local authorities to reflect the winding up of community charge debt collection will reflect the small amount of income which will be foregone by authorities as a result of the policy that we have set out. It is a fact that around £425 million of community charge was not collected in the four years that the charge operated in Scotland. Almost all of that £425 million can no longer be collected. Over 20 years has passed since the community charge was abolished and replaced with the council tax. Um, many people have moved home in that time, moved away from Scotland, um, become married, changed their name or, in certain circumstances, have sadly deceased. They could not now be traced and linked to a debt. Even if a person could be traced, if no attempt had been made to recover outstanding arrears from a debtor within the last 20 years, then the local authority cannot pursue the debt any further. In the last financial year, 2013-14, those authorities still collecting community charge debts collected a total of £327,000. Projecting the declining rate of collection forward, we can easily see a point at which the costs of collecting are greater than the sums collected. Local authorities tell us that the total that they can recover under existing recovery arrangements is £869,000. For years after the abolition of the community charge, collection rates for the community charge and for the council tax which replaced it were lower than for the domestic rates which the community charge replaced. I can understand that there may be a concern that this legislation will have a similar effect. However, people objected to community charge because it was a tax that bore no relation to what people could afford to pay. Council tax liability is linked to ability to pay through the Council Tax Reduction Scheme, which supports those on low incomes in meeting their Council tax liability. Uh, those still paying off community charge debt include some of the poorest and most vulnerable in our community, who, are unable to pay, who were unable to pay at the time and are now paying very small sums towards arrears every week or even having them deducted from Social Security benefits. In some cases, these benefits may be their only source of income. Over 20 years after the community charge was abolished, it could still be many years uh, yet before some debts are cleared. Furthermore, the referendum on independence inspired record numbers of people to register to vote. Many of them had not voted for decades, some never before. We don't want people to, to fear being on the electoral registers because of decades-old debts from discredited legislation which cannot, in all practicality, uh, be collected. This bill will help to avoid that and ensure that everyone's voice continues to be heard. Each local authority still co collecting community charge debt will receive as part of their settlement what they would have collected if their outstanding recovery arrangements had continued. They will not be compensated for the £425 million, which is now uncollectable. This bill is one step which the Scottish Government is taking to make local taxation fairer. The independent commission we will establish to examine fair alternatives to the current system of council tax is another. Meanwhile, we should consign the poll tax to history and extinguish any remaining liability for a disgraced and defunct tax. Thank you very much for that uh, opening statement. And as you've been to the Finance Committee countless occasions, really, uh, you, you know the drill. So I'll ask the, the opening questions and then we'll move uh, around the, the table. Uh, well, let's just start at the beginning in terms of the policy objectives to the bill, which you did actually touch on in your statement. And it says here, it will ensure following record... Following recent high levels of democratic engagement in Scotland, the electoral registers are not used to pursue historic arrears of community charge, as well as ending ongoing repayment arrangements which are already in place. Now, the, the local authority representatives here before, which included representatives of COSLA at Glasgow and Dundee, said that they didn't actually use these um, 
systems to collect the tax. So is your view that it's a perception by people rather than a reality that this is actually used to collect the, this uh, ancient tax? Well, well, shortly after the independence referendum, um, comments were made by um, local authority leaders to the effect that they intended to uh, now use the um, higher level of registration that was part of the um, the product and process of the referendum to um, try to collect further historic poll tax arrears. Um, so I think that was an indication of the intentions of certain local authority leaders. Ten local authorities have already stopped in actually paying this, and the causal view is that legislation is not necessary. Is, 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 do you have any, any of any information about why those local authorities stopped collecting? Is it because they thought that it was actually costing more to bring in the tax than the tax was actually, um, you know, bringing in? Or what, what, what kind of assessment has been made in terms of the cost effectiveness of continued collection? If we were at um, the some of the sums of money that remain to be collected at individual local authority level. You know, let's take, for example, um, Argyll and Butte Council. There's £63 to be collected. Now, uh, you know, it's. I think we can all, with a, a, an application of common sense, realise that the pursuit of £63 in one particular historic poll tax arrear um, is, going to, um, is going to incur... Um, recurring costs to ensure that that is in fact collected. So uh, I think the other authorities who are not collecting um, have obviously come to the conclusion that uh, there is no worthwhile or legitimate uh, area of activity that can be pursued to take that forward. And yet, you know, Dundee seems to collect about a fifth of all the council tax, uh, sorry, poll tax areas that exist out there. It seems to be able to collect that money. Is there any reason why it's different from other local authorities, do you think? The seen from the City of Dundee Council is that essentially when they're collecting arrears from individuals, they allocate those against um, more recent council tax debt. So essentially, um, they are making good council tax um, payments with some of the arrears that have been collected rather than allocating them against historic poll tax um, arrears for which they still have a connection and an ability to collect. Um, so there it's just a, a, a different focus in the City of Dundee Council's approach compared to uh, those of other authorities. Uh, thank you. Um, and uh, have you got any figures at all on, I mean the cause didn't seem to be able to know them, of, of the cost of bringing in the 327,000 that was brought in by the, the still collecting local authorities, have you got any idea about that, about how much it's actually cost costing that convener. Okay. Yeah. Now you, you mentioned in your opening statement about consultation, North Lanarkshire Council said and I quote that it was incongruous that a bill is considered necessary as of the high levels of democratic engagement but the bill itself will not be subject to a formal public consultation, you did touch on uh, that, how it, uh, uh, and, and you explained that in a way, but they go on to say, how are the views of the public, the majority of whom have made payment of their community charge liability, to be understood? I, I would accept that uh, these are uh, not the, 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 the habitual arrangements that we have towards consultation. Um, the government decided to act because we were concerned that, uh, just going back to the comment I made earlier on, and one of your response to your earlier questions, convener, that uh, there was an expressed appetite amongst uh, certain local authority leaders to use the um, information that had been gathered by registration during the independence referendum to essentially reactivate um, the pursuit of many of these uh, outstanding arrears. Um, we felt that sat um, very uncomfortably with what I thought was a general view across the country of wide appreciation of the upsurge in democratic participation that we saw and which was supported and complemented right across the political spectrum in the independence referendum. It would be a rather strange conclusion, we felt, uh, to that democratic process to then use the information that had been gathered to pursue historic debts from a tax that is discredited and it has not been operational for over 20 years in Scotland. Um, we wanted, therefore, to, to do two things. We wanted to um, act um, expeditiously to address that point, um, which is why we have pursued a shorter consultation process. And, of course, the 
organisations that would um, potentially suffer any financial impact as a consequence, a negative financial impact, have been consulted with as a consequence of this process. But we also wanted to make sure that we made it absolutely crystal clear from a local authority perspective that local authorities were absolved of any statutory obligation to collect poll tax debt, which up until the passage of this legislation um, will remain the case. Thank you. Now, of course, all MSPs, or I imagine most of them, if not all, certainly I have, received a, a number of uh, communications from constituents who have said, and I quote, what about those who paid at the time? And as East Ayrshire Council has said, if the Scottish Government is determined to write off this debt, will they then reimburse the millions of law-abiding people who for many years paid their community charge, even though they did not agree with it in principle? And that is a... A, a very um, frequent one, that's, uh, um, that was from an individual called John Nellis, I should have said, but East Ayrshire Council has raised similar concerns. Um, I wonder if you can comment on that, because that's something that we're all getting correspondence about, I would suggest. Certainly I've not had anyone, incidentally, tell me what a great idea the bill is, but I've had plenty of folk writing to me on those kind of, uh, on those kind of terms. Absolutely. Um, I, I, I acknowledge the uh, the, the point that you make, Kavir, and uh, of course I, I've had letters from uh, my own constituents of uh, expressing exactly the same point. Um, I think what I would say is that we are dealing here with a situation where um, a, a tax that was the subject of um, significant public disquiet at the time of its implementation and was a very short-lived tax that only functioned for four years. Um, demonstrating its unsustainability as a particular local tax. Um, that action was taken over 20 years ago to address the inadequacies of the poll tax and to abolish it. Um, I think we have given um, a very reasonable length of time and opportunity for historic debts to be collected. And we're now reaching the point where it is well, in certain parts of the country, voluntarily, 10 local authorities have decided not to collect any more. So they have essentially taken the decision that uh, the government is now proposing to legislate for. Um, so we, we, we've just reached a point, I think, a very pragmatic point, where we all have to recognise that this uh, tax has entirely run its course and the collection of the remaining and outstanding um, elements of the tax that can be collected um, is now a much more... Um, well, it's a, it, it involves all the practical issues that you've raised, Convener, in your own questions about uh, the additional costs of collection and the disproportionate costs of collection for the sums that are actually collected. Uh, none of that, uh, of course, takes away from the, the, the very clear view which I have, which the government has, and which is implicit in all of the legislation that we take forward, is that people should properly pay the taxes for which they are liable. And um, that is the message that we take in relation to the council tax. It's what we take in relation to the taxes for which we will soon be responsible in relation to land and buildings, transaction tax and also landfill tax. I understand your point, point of view. The East the Ayrshire quote I should have used there was, um, it's difficult argument to have with an individual who feels aggrieved that they have paid and in some cases placed themselves in considerable financial hardship to do so when others are now being excused of their obligations. So that's the kind of issue for people uh, sometimes in the local authority front line. But uh, others may explore that further. But I just want to make one final point to give uh, colleagues around the table a chance to, to make their own. And it's just in re relation to, to the comments by the Director of Finance at Highland Council. He said not, he's not supportive of the bill. Local authorities are required by law to take all legal means at their disposal to collect the tax due. And the point he's raised is the issue of unintended consequences. And you've touched on the fact that you want others to continue to pay, or everyone to continue to pay, uh, the council tax, but he's basically said the legislation may leave the impression that if you avoid paying debt long enough, it will eventually be written off, despite what this government is saying at the moment. And uh, it, it, at the same time, he talks about how the timing of the bill and commission, um, the, the council tax commission, are very worrying in terms of the possible, pos possible negative impacts on future council tax collection levels, and that this uh, bill brings in avoidable risk. I just wonder if you can comment on those points. The, the fundamental difference between what we are um, discussing today and the council tax is the council tax is a live tax and the poll tax is a dead tax. 
That's the fundamental difference. And that's why I think there's no similarity in the point raised by the Director of Finance of Highland Council. The poll tax is a dead tax and we are um, essentially pursuing um, historic liabilities that we can see from the data are um, petering out year by year in terms of the ability to collect. If I look at the data, if I go back to uh, 10 years convener, uh, £3,916,000 was being collected in poll tax arrears in 2004-05. Uh, in the last financial year, it was £327,000. So it's quite clear it's petering out and disproportionate resources have been used in collection. And crucially, this is a dead tax. It is no longer in place. The council tax is a live tax and people have obligations to pay it. And I unreservedly um, support the necessity of individuals to pay um, their council tax. In terms of collection rates, the collection rate for um, the poll tax was approximately 88.4%. The in-year collection of the council tax is 95.2%. That's the in-year collection, which is the, for the immediate year for which liability arises. Um, the expectation is that in excess of 97% of council tax is actually collected once follow-up mechanisms are taken within short order to ensure its collection. So I think the pattern of collection capability between the council tax and this dead poll tax um, is, is the strongest reassurance that uh, can be offered to the Director of Finance of Highland Council. But is there not an issue of public perception, though? That's, the, I think, the issue that she's raised, that you know people may feel, regardless of you, the, the the political views that you've expressed in terms of one tax and another, that people might feel, well, hold on a second, you know, that was written out, what, what, you know, if I hang on long enough, okay, they may still be pursued just as actively for the council tax, but there may be more resistance to actually paying it, which will impact on council tax collection figures. I think that's a point that a number of local authorities have been trying to uh, make to us. I think, the, I think the, the difference is easily expressed and made clear as the difference between it being a dead tax and a live tax. That's the point. And, um, you know, we're not dealing with arrears that crystallised in the last month or the last 12 months even. We're, we're, we're dealing with arrears that crystallised 20 years ago. And we're dealing with the, the very end of the, the line of this particular tax. Whereas on the council tax, an individual um, not paying their council tax is certainly my experience um, in the locality I represent, pursued um, assiduously at a number of levels. One, to make sure that any financial advice that is available to an individual, that should be available to an individual in financial hardship, um, is made available to them so that if there's a, a, a payment problem that the individual has with the council tax, uh, the local authority will be intent on finding out if they are entitled to a council tax reduction or some other form of support. Um, uh, and then if not, then the, they're pursued for collection and those collection rates that I've just talked about, I think, give us confidence that um, those mechanisms are in place within local authorities. Stop at this point, but you've, you've prompted another question, then I'll, I will let colleagues in. You, you talked about alive and the dead tax, but if the Scottish Government were to replace the council tax with a local income tax, then the council tax might be classed by some people then as a dead tax. I mean... You know, how would, how would that argument that you've made there hold water in terms of if we were to move to, if, if we were to, move to another taxation system after, for example, the next Scottish elections, if the SNP government was re-elected? Because we're not dealing with life for life here. Vera, the council tax is currently a live tax, been paid today. The poll tax was last, a, a demand was last issued over 20 years ago to anybody in Scotland. These are not comparable. They are completely different concepts. And as I've also said in relation to the point about, you know, if there was to be a replacement to the council tax, council tax collection rates are upward of 97%. So the performance of local authorities in actually collecting the tax is very high and very strong, significantly stronger than at any stage under the community charge. And as I say, the community charge is over 20 years old, dead. Thank you for that. I will now let colleagues in. Uh, John, to be followed by Mark. Hey, thanks, convener. Um, I mean, the point I think you've made 
was that uh, one of the arguments for the bill is that we don't want councils wasting money on spending, collecting very little money. I mean, is there evidence that councils are spending a lot of money because, I mean, we got the impression from Glasgow and Dundee that actually their collection costs are, are quite minimal. Well, some councils are not spending any money at all because they've stopped collecting it. So that's just an, the end of the story for 10 local authorities. Um, there obviously will be costs of collection involved in the remaining outstanding arrears, but um, some of those costs will have been um, acquired over time and putting in place payment arrangements that will now be running their course. If we didn't do anything, do you think that 10 would just kind of drift upwards till eventually it got to 32? Yes. Uh -huh. Thanks. Um, do you know, I mean, I asked the councils, but they didn't really know. Sorry, yes. I'd probably also add on to that. However, there would still be an oblig a statutory obligation on local authorities to collect. So the point of this legislation is to absolve local authorities of that statutory obligation, which I would have thought and which is the point I've made to COSLA, would be something that would be welcomed by local government. I mean, my guess is, I don't know if you could answer this, but I mean, you know, the people who are now paying a pound a week or something are perhaps people in quite a lot of poverty and are, are actually honest in that they're trying to pay the pound a week compared to the vast majority, which is just not being paid at all. I suppose that's... Well, there will be, you know, there will be in small sums of money that, mm -hmm. uh, that are being paid. You know, if we... If you look at 2013-14, Aberdeenshire Council um, raised £1,000. Um, likewise in Murray and in, and in uh, Inverclyde. You know, so these are going to be made up by very small sums of money that have been paid by individuals. Okay. Again, I was asking the councils if they knew what, how long other organisations pursue debt and, and they didn't really know. I don't know if you can give us any idea of that. Just to, so we get a comparison with the kind of idea of 20 years. I mean, I don't. do we know how long the utility companies say would pursue debt or do we know how long, say, a shop would pursue a debt? Um, the length of time that um, varies in, in different circumstances. Um, there will be... Um, uh, there will be examples um, uh, in the Prescription and Limitation Scotland Act 1973, some debts and obligations prescribe after five years. So mm -hmm. there will be... Now, who that applies to, uh, I'm afraid I don't have in front of me, um, but uh, there will be variations in the uh, degree to which obligations um, uh, exist for. So... Um, uh, well, by implication, therefore, some debts get written off much quicker, and uh, therefore, presumably, t well, 20 years, it seems to me, therefore, is not a particularly short period of time. It's quite a long period of time. It is a long period of time, yes. OK, thank you. And it, really, the final thing I wanted to touch on was the 869,000 and how it's being split up. Uh, I mean, presumably, you had various options. You know, one would have been to take the total debt and say, I don't, is it 0.02% or something that we're actually paying out and just give it in proportion to the debt. A another option, I mean, the council's basically told us that the net value of the debt in their accounts is nil because they have fully provided for it. So presumably there was an argument that the councils did not need any money and, and the 869,000 is a bonus. Uh, but you've chosen the third option of based on what they're actually collecting. Could you explain to us why you chose that option? Well, I think that, that struck me as the, uh, as the fair option, that if <coughs> local authorities were still endeavouring to collect the elements of the poll tax and they had and were able to provide for us, which they have done through COSLA, um, the, uh, the, the sums of money, authority by authority, that um, are still essentially in play to be collected, um, I thought it was a reasonable point of agreement um, to accept that the government should compensate local authorities for those sums of money. Okay, thank you. Uh, I should point out, Cabinet Secretary, that all Highland Council have said that uh, local authorities uh, are required to take all legal means at their disposal to collect due tax, and they're not supportive of the bill. They have, in fact, ceased collection. Uh, that's um, absolutely correct. Yeah. Marked before by Gavin. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, the evidence that was given to us earlier from the local authorities, um, the indication was, well, the, the answer was given to, to Jean Urquhart at the time that the, the debts are not 
currently held on the books by the councils. Um, the, the, the sums that we're speaking about here don't show up on, on the council's annual return of accounts, for example. Um, do you feel that the £425 million pound figure that's bandied around is an unhelpful one in the sense that, A, the debts are not currently held against the accounts of the council, but also the point that you've raised about the likelihood of recovery of the vast bulk of that debt? Well, I, th I think the, the £425 million pound figure is, well, as I said in my opening statement, it, it is a fact that that is the amount that is currently uncollected mm. of poll tax debt. Um, but it's a meaningless figure because it's never going to be collected. Mm. And certain authorities, well, ten authorities, have decided that their share of that £425 million pounds is just not going to be collected. And some of them haven't been collecting it for some considerable time. So it's just completely meaningless as, uh, as, as a... A, 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 you know, as a relevant figure. I, I wonder if you would agree with me that where those authorities and those ten authorities who've taken the local decision to uh, cease collection, um, the 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 issues that are being raised that um, the the legislation could give rise to uh, individual behaviours around council tax debts, council tax arrears we would have perhaps seen evidence of that manifesting itself in those local authorities that had taken that local decision. But given the collection figures that you've uh, pointed out, that doesn't appear to have been the case. And therefore, would you suggest that the experience in those local authority areas would suggest that those fears may perhaps be unfounded? I, I just think we're talking about two completely different things here. And um, I think local authorities uh, deploy... Um, very good practice in relation to council tax collection. Um, the, the rates of council tax collection have improved significantly over the last, um, well, nearly 20 years. They've uh, become very much stronger. And um, I think authorities um, pursue that approach in, a, in an effective way. Uh, as a consequence of that, I think what we are essentially doing here is tidying up a, a long-standing, outstanding uh, a long-standing and outstanding issue um, and doing it in a way that is fair to local government. Mm. The the evidence we received earlier, um, Dundee City Council and, and Glasgow City Council said that um, they were questioned around the, the sort of the, 20, the, year, the rule of prescription, the 20-year limit through which action can be taken. And the indication appeared to be that by renewal of summary warrant, they had essentially got around the 20-year the prescription. So the debt as they saw it, remained in theory recoverable be, because they, they were not subject to the 20-year uh, limit. The sort of two questions I have off the back of that are, um, do you think that um, local authorities should be taking that view in terms of the whole debt sum, given what we know about recoverability anyway? But also, does the Scottish Government take a view around the 20-year the prescription period? I know it's separate perhaps from the legislation, but obviously it has given rise to the disparity that exists between the situation south of the border, where I think it's a six-year period that, that mm. the debt was pursuable compared to a 20-year period in Scotland. And obviously that's been thrown into contrast as a result of this move. Has the Scottish Government taken any view on that beyond this legislation as something it might examine? As a point in principle, no, we haven't. Um, I, I think what we... Um, the conclusion we've come to has been prompted by um, the set of circumstances that I, I, I raised with the convener at the outset, um, whereby the suggestion that uh, the upsurge in democratic participation in the referendum and the participation in the, in the, in the electoral process should so somehow be used as a, as, a, as a route to reactivating the pursuit of historic debt, which, um, as Mr MacDonald has said, um, is um, would, would become prescribed in circumstances where the debt had not been pursued in any way um, uh, over a 20-year period. Um, so th 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 that's what's prompted our, our action on this um, particular piece of legislation. Uh, as to the general uh, principle and what underpins the terms of the prescription limitation Scotland Act 1973, the, the government hasn't given consideration to that point. Okay. And, and just one final question, if I may, um, Convener. The, a number of witnesses 
um, well, sorry, a number of uh, submissions to the committee have spoken about um, sporadic and informal payments. I.e., those uh, the the Scottish government has received the 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 sums that were likely to come in from those payment plans or, or recovery plans that were in place. But some local authorities have spoken about the existence of sporadic and informal payments. Now, presumably the Scottish Government did not factor those into the calculation because there is no way to come to any kind of accurate figure about the potential of somebody turning up at the doorstep of a council and saying they wish to make good their debt without there already being a, a, a recovery plan in place. Um, there, there, is, um, there is no reliable means of um, estimating that. Um, I think one of the things we can, we can look to is the pattern of payment under the poll tax arrears and as I indicated earlier on that is steadily declining year by year to the point where in the last financial year for which data is available um, it totaled £327,000 um, uh, so you know, there, there, there's, there's, um, uh, we're seeing that petering out quite significantly. Um, there is of course, you know, if an individual is troubled by all of this um, there's nothing to stop them paying their, off their arrears now, if they really want to. There's nothing to stop that. There's nothing to stop them after the bill has been um, enacted, making a donation to a local authority to assist with its work. There's nothing to stop them doing that, if they're particularly troubled by that. Um, but I think in terms of the uh, orderly disposal of liabilities to local authorities, uh, I think this is the right move for the government to take. Okay, Gavin, to be followed by Jean. Thank you. Um, Cabinet Secretary, you make quite a big distinction, uh, you did it on several occasions, between what you describe as a live tax and a dead tax. Um, for how much longer will the council tax be a live tax? Well, it's a live tax today, and it'll be a live tax for as long as Parliament wishes it to be a live tax. Is it correct to say, though, that the government is setting up a commission which meets, I think, tomorrow with the objective of replacing the council tax? The government's setting up a commission, as we set out in the programme for government, to um, try to work with other political parties, um, and the invitation has been extended to all political parties to participate, and I do hope that all political parties decide to participate in this given the fact that the Local Government and Regeneration Committee uh, suggested that the government should uh, work to create agreement amongst all political parties on this question um, and also to work in partnership with our local authority colleagues on arriving at um, an approach to local taxation that, um, was, uh, that was broadly supported. So that's the objective of the a commission that the government is setting up and I, I look forward to all political parties participating in that process. In, in, in terms of the wording though, in terms of what the government has said and indeed the letter sent to political parties, did it say an approach to local taxation or does it say replace the council tax? I don't have the letter in front of me, convener, so I, I'm happy to provide that letter. I'm happy, it was the, it, I, I'm, I, I'm happy to provide the letter to the committee. I don't have it in front of me to... I, um, to, to uh, set that out. I'll, I'll leave that. I'm just trying to establish that the, the government's intention, as far as I'm concerned, is, is to replace the council tax and turn that into, uh, to use the cabinet secretary's word, a, a dead tax. That that was the purpose of the. Yeah, question but I, think, I think let, let's let's. Because I don't. I, you know, I've not come equipped, convener, with the um, the wording from the government's manifesto. But um, and, and so so please don't have this quoted back to me, what I'm about to say, but I think the government's manifesto said something like, um, consult with others to design a system of, of local taxation um, that, was, that had a better relationship to the ability to pay, something like that. I don't think that was the exact wording, but it was of that character. And we're just inviting other political parties to be involved in that conversation. Okay, I'll leave, I'll leave that issue. You use the word consult there, Cabinet Secretary, which, which leads on nicely to the idea of a, a consultation. Um, the convener put the question to you, others have, have raised it, but how are the views of the, in the absence of a consultation, how are the views of the public being taken into account in the formulation of this bill? 
well, clearly we, we hear representations from members of the public, we hear representations from members of Parliament on behalf of their constituents. Um, I've certainly replied to a number of members of Parliament um, who've raised um, issues with me about uh, the proposals in the bill. OK, but do you not think the public should have a say prior to um, stage one in that there is a there should be a formal consultation on the issue? Well, we are where we are. We've, we, we've sought agreement of Parliament to undertake an expedited bill process to enable us to um, make this bill effective from the 1st of February 2015 to ensure that there is clarity before the start of the next financial year. OK, but do you not think there should have been some, uh, even an expedited public consultation? Well, I, I, certainly, I don't feel as if I am being insulated from public opinion on this issue because, as the convener says, you know, a, a number of members of the public have raised this issue. As I've indicated already to Mr Brown, I've replied to a number of members of Parliament who have raised um, the very issue that Mr Brown is raising with me. Um, so the government is conscious of, uh, of that issue. Uh, I understand the concerns that are expressed by uh, members of the public uh, who have paid their, their, their community charge, uh, as, uh, as I have done, as I should, I should probably make that clear, since I'm old enough to have been liable for the community charge, um, and uh, that uh, I understand the concerns that these members of the public are raising. Okay. Um, in terms of the, what did happen there, I mean, I look at your, your policy memorandum under the heading consultation, uh, officials have consulted COSLA and local authority practitioners on development of the provisions in the bill which have operational implications for local authorities uh, to ensure these provisions are informed by how community charge debt collection operates in practice. Um, I was reading out paragraph 14, page 3 of the policy memorandum. Um, but when I asked COSLA today and the two local authorities who were giving evidence, so it was only two local authorities, about the consultation process with them. Um, I mean, you can check, obviously, the record in the official report, but the suggestion was made that there was a, a meeting to discuss quantum uh, which lasted uh, longer, uh, shorter uh, than that meeting had taken place at that time, which was about 40 minutes on the clock at that stage. Um, but their understanding, and certainly the witnesses who spoke to us, was that there hadn't been any uh, consultation on the terms of the bill the political objectives of the bill um, and indeed some of the unintended consequences. Now, that's what, that, that's what those witnesses said. Are you saying to me that there were other consultations with calls that those witnesses weren't aware of? And if so, what, what was well, the I, nature? I, 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 I don't know what uh, uh, instances or examples of consultation were being um, mentioned by um, the local authorities that were here. I'm certainly very happy to provide the committee with um, an explanation of the um, the consultation steps that were taken by ministers and officials with local government. I can confirm one bit of it for the sake of the record. Um, the you know, Mr. Brown asked me about um, consultation about the policy intent and the principle of it. Uh, there was no consultation with local government about that point. I telephoned the president of COSLA about 15 or 20 minutes before I knew the statement was going to be made in Parliament to give him advance warning. Uh, so that's, you know, that's, that's what consultation there was. So we didn't ask COSLA, did they agree with us about this? I phoned the President of COSLA to advise him in advance that this announcement would be made. OK. You, you, I mean, you're going to furnish with, with, with the record, but it, it, I only say that because the, the policy memorandum says... Um, there was consultation on the development of the provisions in the bill, and that just seemed different to what I heard today. But, of course, they may not have had the complete picture. They may not have, but I'll, I'll furnish the committee with the detail that supports paragraph 14. OK, I'm grateful for that. Um, what, what do you say, I mean, the convener raised the point again, but what, what does the government say to, to two individuals, one individual who both disagreed with the community charge, one of whom ended up paying it, uh, perhaps uh, making sacrifices to do so, and another who simply didn't um, and is now being uh, absolved of it. I mean, how, how does the government explain that to those two individuals in terms of uh, fairness and the way government ought to operate? What I'd say is that I, I start from the principle that people should pay their taxes. That's my basic principle in all this. So um, I, don't, um, I don't support uh, the 
uh, the fact that people do not pay the taxes for which they are liable. Um, that's the first thing I would say. The second thing is that I think we're dealing with quite exceptional circumstances here. We are dealing with um, a tax that lasted four years, that was the subject of massive political controversy, um, of enormous political disruption, very significant political disruption to one individual that I can uh, remember who lost office on the back of the poll tax, uh, the late Prime Minister, Mrs Thatcher. Um, so this was an, a, an issue of enormous political conflict and dispute. And it was concluded 20, over 20 years ago. And the best efforts of local government have been deployed over 20 years to try to collect this tax. And as we see from the data that we have in front of us, um, various authorities over the years have worked away at trying to collect these arrears. And in certain circumstances, for example, in Falkirk, nothing has been collected of this tax since, well, I've got the data back to 2003-04, and nothing has been collected in Falkirk since then. So we're, we're simply, so there has been efforts around the country to try to collect the tax. Um, we have reached a point where um, there has been a particular um, intervention which has prompted the government to say, look, let's just draw a line on this. Um, ten local authorities have decided um, not to collect any tax and aren't doing so. And we are simply regular, regularising that across the country. And the final point I'd say to, to the individuals to which Mr Brown refers is that I appreciate and value the fact that these individuals have fulfilled their obligations to the public purse. And I acknowledge that um, what the government um, is proposing is, is, is perhaps not something that they support uh, but it's something that we believe is important to bring to a close what is a pretty unsatisfactory and unsavoury part of our political and taxation history. Another issue, the, I mean, it's been raised briefly, but the, uh, already here, but a number of councils raised it. That there is a concern among the councils that have submitted evidence to us that it could impact on their council tax collection. Uh, and you've obviously referred to the, the current collection rates. If, though, their fears turn out to be true, and it does impact on council tax collection, particularly historic council tax collection, and they can demonstrate that it has hardened attitudes, if you like, or just made it more difficult to collect the money, is the government uh, agreeable to underwrite uh, those sums that they uh, feel they've lost out on, or is the government um, hoping that, I mean, you're hoping it doesn't turn out to be the case. If it does turn out to be the case, is the government going to back local government and underwrite those sums? Well, I think the, I think the distinction I would make is the one I made to the convener, and that's the difference between a dead tax and a live tax. Uh, there's a live tax for the council tax. I, I would encourage local authorities to um, pursue council tax collection as efficiently as they currently do so. Uh, I see nothing that is a read across from the abolition of historic poll tax debt, which is now a clearly a uncollectible in the country and has been for some considerable time. I see no connection between that and the collection of the current council tax. You don't see the connection, but if, 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 if there was, if, if the council's fears as expressed to us turn out to be correct and they can demonstrate to some degree that that has been the case, as a matter of principle, is the government effectively putting its money where its mouth is and underwriting? No, because this, the collection of council tax is the responsibility of local government and it's an ongoing responsibility of local government and local authorities to do that. I, I, don't, mean, I don't mean the collection of current, but if, if it turns out their historic rates of council tax debts from years gone by, if there's a dramatic slowdown in the collection rate of that and it could be attributed to this policy... <coughs> then is the government well, not willing to, to move to help councils there? It, no, because that's okay. the responsibility of local authorities to undertake that collection activity. And uh, there is a... You know, for example, Mr. Mr Brown said there that 
um, if it could be demonstrated that that slowdown was attributed to the passage of this legislation, that would be a really interesting point to prove and demonstrate how that had any substance about it. Because if that was used, for example, as an excuse by somebody to resist um, due process in pursuing, uh, in the collection of a council tax liability, uh, there would be no substance or standing to that whatsoever in due process. All right. And last question then. In terms of the, um, you said that local authority leaders were saying publicly, that, or privately, I don't know if you said it, they were saying it publicly or privately, they intended to use the expanded electoral roll uh, to collect uh, backdated community charge debts. Um, they may well use it to uh, collect backdated or historic council tax debts too. I mean, is the government comfortable with that? Uh, the individuals have got liabilities for um, the council tax, which I think individuals should fulfil, and local authorities are entitled to use the publicly available information at their disposal to collect uh, arrears of council tax. Okay. Uh, Jean, to be followed by Richard. Thank you, Convener. And just a, a point of clarification for me, I think, Cabinet Secretary, and that is that we talk about needing, we need to have this legislation in order to absolve uh, the councils from pursuing uh, taxes, perhaps from people who have since deceased or emigrated or whatever. Um, and yet there are 10 local authorities who have stopped doing that without legislation. And I, I just wonder what the, the... On the one hand, we seem to be saying that, that the councils are legally obliged to pursue tax. Um, what, what, what difference, then, for the 10 local authorities who appear not to need the legislation to do what, what you think they should be doing? The, the 10 local authorities who are not collecting any are um, essentially... You know, voluntarily turning a blind eye to the collection, or maybe it's impractical for them to collect any. Maybe there's, maybe they just have absolutely reached the the end of the road, but there will still be obligations there in law, and that's the purpose of the legislation is to remove that obligation in law. Right. And do you think that there, there might have been a, a way forward in other local authorities doing it on a on a voluntary basis in the same in the same way rather than um, legislation well i think the, the i think the legislation removing this uh, particular obligation and a duty on local authorities i think just clears up the law and where we have the opportunity to do that uh, we should take that to make it absolutely crystal clear where the law stands on these matters okay and um, and finally do we have any idea how how many uh, people are I mean I'm assuming that a local authority would not be after 20 years pursuing somebody who was dead or had emigrated 15 years ago I mean do we do we know f for sure that the, the amount of money that we're talking about is actually including money's 20 years worth of poll tax that's uh, uh, from somebody who's deceased or has emigrated, or moved to another part of uh, UK. I, I don't have I don't have particular. Obviously, we're dealing with you know a range of individuals here. I don't have any particular colour on the the nature of who is being pursued, who's got particular payment arrangements in place. Uh, I, I don't uh, I can't furnish the committee with with that. But what there is is a. Um, is a variety of different levels of collection activity around the country in different authorities. And um, it is clear from my reading of the data, or the conclusion I arrive at, having looked at the data, is that um, essentially there have been a number of payment arrangements in place with a reasonably large number of individuals over probably a 15 to 20 year period since the uh, abolition of the of the poll tax, and that th those existing arrangements have been steadily petering out, and what you've not seen is um, an upsurge in arrangements. Let's say five years ago, to get new people to 
accept their, their obligations and to pay those up. I think the data, the conclusion I arrive at from the data, is that the payment arrangements were put in place in 1992, 93, 94, 95, 96, and then they're just generally petered out. Right. Um, I think some of that information will be quite important in terms of uh, perhaps convincing some of the people who are writing to me, as they are to you and everybody and all, all other MSPs uh, who see this as, a, as unfair. I personally don't agree with their, with their view, but I, I think it will be important uh, that there is some... Uh, presentation of, of some of these facts that make it much more uh, real and I think back up the le legislation rather than that that's going to be quite easy easy to have to, to deliver that, that information to people who feel that it's un, unfair um, I think we have to accept that in, in, the, in the, the some of the consultation papers that we've had back from local authorities there is a and I, I think something that we've talked about before in terms of tax collection, a confidence that's required, that actually people confidently pay tax, that people don't like being in debt. And I think, I think both of these are key in many ways to, to this legislation. That's in a sense my, my conclusion that I arrive at, looking at the, the issues around about council tax collection, that you know, the council tax collection rates... Um, are really very strong, and they've got much stronger in recent years. So I think there is that evidence that people are um, uh, actively paying their obligations towards local authorities to support the public services that are available in our localities. So I think that, that point is very strongly and clearly evidenced by uh, the, uh, the, the experience of uh, council tax collection. Thank you. Thank you. Can I understand the logic of your argument about why you wanted to move quickly uh, with this uh, policy? Um, uh, but this morning you've uh, basically said that there was no consultation at all with local authorities about the intent to bring forward this legislation. Surely the, this policy could have been introduced uh, quickly, expeditiously, but also including time to have that dialogue properly with local authorities over this intent uh, to bring this forward. And how does that approach sit with the Scottish Government's uh, relationship to local authorities and respect for the importance uh, of, of their duties, their responsibilities and their views? I think we, um, as... as as a minister who's been immersed in our dialogue and discussions with local governments since 2007, I, I, I think there is, uh, frankly, a barload of evidence of the government's good practice in communication and dialogue with local government about the formulation of shared priorities and about the development of the wider policy agenda, which uh, I see as a partnership between um, the Scottish government and local government. Um, oh, oh, so. That, that yeah, I think that stands. Do you think this, this meets the standard of good practice? It, well, I don't. I don't think this is a particularly typical example of how. Well, the point I was making is that we've got uh, ample evidence of the way in which the government uh, properly, fully, openly, exhaustively consults with local government about many questions. This I would fully acknowledge is not the norm. Um, I accept that. Um, we acted because we didn't like the way in which post referendum. The upsurge in democratic participation was being suggested as being a means of collecting historic poll tax arrears by certain local authority leaders, and we wanted to act swiftly to nip it in the bud. And okay, we could have had an extensive consultation, but that wouldn't have swiftly nipped it in the bud. I, mean, I appreciate your, your point of view on that, but I mean, Jean Urquhart raised the again the important question of to what extent legislation is necessary. This was raised by Cosler as well. So if you had had that consultation with them beforehand, that uh, whole area of thought could have been explored more considerably. And to what extent did you consider alternative routes legislation um, to achieve the policy objective before bringing this bill forward? The, the, the President of COSLA has, has made the point to me in correspondence that um, the, 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 you know, as to whether or not legislation was required. And the response that I've provided to Councillor O'Neill 
has been to say that um, we wanted to legislate to remove any possible doubt uh, about the solution to these issues. Um, we wanted to make it absolutely crystal clear in law that having come to an agreement with local government about the, um, the government uh, meeting the cost of the outstanding collectible poll tax debts that could be identified by local authorities, um, we wanted to uh, essentially draw this matter to a conclusion with a clarity that would enable um, local authorities to be um, absolved of, the, of any obligation to collect any further arrears. And I think that legal clarity, or I would have thought that legal clarity would be something that would be welcomed by local government. In his questions to you, Gavin Brown raised the issue of using electoral roll um, generally in terms of um, to, to, to recover uh, debts to, to councils, and you said that you thought that was appropriate for um, uh, council tax debt. But, but did you explore at all the possibility, uh, instead of approaching a policy whereby uh, it was made clear to local authorities by guidance or whatever necessary mechanism, in fact, you know, local uh, electoral registration, electoral registers should not be used for those purposes. That in fact, councils should not be using that information when it when it comes to um, uh, pursuing debts owed to them. I mean, because doesn't the the uh, issue apply to council tax as, do, as it does, in fact, to uh, apply uh, it in terms of this tax? In that uh, that no, that shouldn't really be a factor when encouraging people to vote or take part in the democratic process. Um. I think there's I think there's a number of factors that um, are, are wrapped up in that particular question. I, I think the, the simplest way to to address this point is to look at what is the you know what is the the core substance of the issue at stake here. The issue at stake here is should um, is it desirable for people to become involved in the democratic process um, in 2014? and find that the first thing that happens to them as a consequence of that is that they are pursued for historic poll tax arrears uh, which have been dead for 20 years. Uh, is that the first thing that we should make as a connection? I, I, I fundamentally disapprove of that. I think that's the wrong thing to do, which is why we're legislating for what we're legislating. Now, it's a wider question about um, the utilisation of the electoral role. Um, I have concerns about um, the way in which the electoral role um, can be available to a whole variety of different organisations to pursue individuals, not necessarily for debt, but for other purposes. Um, you know, I get representations quite frequently from constituents who are who feel, um, you know, actively pursued by external organisations, which you know, using clearly using the electoral role. And I think we have to look at some of those questions, which is some of the issues the government has raised with the the UK government in this respect. Um, but fundamentally, um, I think the, the, the way to address this issue is to provide absolute legal clarity for local authorities that um, the debts arising from the poll tax have been extinguished, and that uh, is the issue that, we've con that we address here. But you are comfortable with councils using information to chase up council tax debt? Uh, they're entitled to do so, yes. And, and finally, um, convener, um, will the issue of debt recovery be part of the discussions uh, that, you, that will be had at the Commission you've established to discuss the future of local taxation? In respect of what? Just this general issue. I mean, obviously, um, some local authorities, including um, Highland Council, have raised the issue. Their concerns of a precedent um, set by uh, this legislation. So, I mean, do you think that, the, that that general approach in terms of maximising income to councils, the appropriate way to chase up um, um, debts to council should be part of those discussions, or that should be a separate issue? I think it should be a separate okay. issue. Yep. Thank you, Rich. Uh, I'd like to thank the Cabinet Secretary for his evidence. Um, I'm just wondering if there's any further points you want to make, Cabinet Nothing Secretary? Else, You're happy to wind up this session. OK, uh, I'd like to call a two-minute recess then, just to allow a changeover of officials.
OK, folks, uh, our next item of business is to take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary on the landfill tax, prescribed landfill site activities, Order 2014. The Cabinet Secretary is joined for this item by David Carucci, Neil Ferguson and John St. Clair from, of the Scottish Government. Sorry? I'm blind as a bat, actually. Apologies for that, actually. Sorry, it's Greg Walker. Do apologise. Um, uh, replacing John Sinclair. Uh, I'd like to invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening uh, statement explaining the instrument and I'd also like to remind him not to move the motion at this point. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Convener. Um, Section 6 of the Landfill Tax Scotland Act 2014 provides a power to prescribe certain landfill site activities. If a prescribed landfill site activity is carried out at a landfill site, the activity is treated as a disposal of waste to landfill at that site. The list of prescribed activities in Regulation 3 of this order relates to temporary engineering activities on a landfill site. The background to this order has its origin in case law concerning the UK tax in the case brought by Waste Resources Group against HMRC in 2008. The English Court of Appeal ruled in favour of the Waste Resources Group. It concluded that engineering activities on a landfill site were classed as non-waste disposals to land and as such those activities fell outside the UK tax. In response to the ruling in the following year, the UK Government brought forward the Landfill Tax Prescribed Landfill Site Activities Order 2009 to bring temporary engineering works into the scope of the tax. It is the Scottish Government's view that all waste material deposited at a landfill tax should be subject to Scottish landfill tax unless, of course, there is a specific exemption. It is deposited in a non-disposal area or is used in the final restoration of the site. Building on the experience of HMRC in that case, this order brings material from temporary engineering works on a landfill site into the scope of the tax. Activities relating to the permanent restoration of a landfill site are not, however, within the scope of the Scottish landfill tax, as we would not want to create any barriers to the full and final remediation of a landfill site. A draft order was included in the public consultation paper Scottish Landfill Tax, a consultation on subordinate legislation published in June of last year. 85% of respondents agreed with the proposed orders. Um, with the proposed order, Ernst and Young LLP and CETA UK Limited, for example, suggested that mirroring the UK list of prescribed activities would alleviate concerns about the possibility of waste tourism. Thank you very much for that, Cabinet Secretary. I have no questions myself. I just want to ask members of the committee if they have any questions. Uh, John Mason. Yes, I mean, the argument has been put that uh, if somebody builds a road somewhere else, especially maybe they'd be using recycled material, that there wouldn't be any tax on that. So it seems to some people illogical that there should be a tax on a road that was built within a landfill site. Can you, can you just explain your thinking why that would not be the case? The... the I think the, the rationale for this is to ensure that um, activity that gives rise to waste that has to um, essentially reach a landfill destination is properly taxed in that process and in all circumstances. So just the fact that it's activity that's happening within a landfill site doesn't absolve it of that necessity to be captured by the consistency of the um, uh, of the uh, 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 of the uh, of the of the tax yeah okay thank you Mark? Is it not the, case that the same materials used outside the site to improve access and transportation wouldn't attract the tax is that not the case is that not the point that's being made by some of the people who are concerned about this I mean, the Chartered Institute of Taxation say it is difficult to see why building a road inside a landfill site should be considered as a disposal of waste when the same activity done outside a site would not be. That's what is the source of the concern, I think. Well, because I think I think we have to look at where the, the, the waste is clearly being generated within that site and has to be disposed of. That I think that is the point that we have to focus on. Um, the, the point that Mr Chisholm is making um, about uh, a development outside a landfill site is that um, that will be sourced from materials which will have come from a variety of different sources for which whatever tax has got to be charged has been charged. Um, the distinction we're making here is that where um, a road construction is undertaken within a landfill site, um, the 
the, the, the purpose of doing that should have given rise to landfill tax if the material had been removed from that site and gone to a landfill tax, uh, to a landfill site. So it's establishing that, it, it's, uh, it's establishing that point that if there is waste, there has to be a charge on that waste, even though it may be used within a landfill site. Is the is the point that is the, is, the, is the simplest I can try to express it. <laughs> I shall reflect on your response. <laughs> it's the most generous, the most generous response. Uh, no further uh, questions. Uh, so we now move to the debate on the motion. I invite the cabinet secretary formally to move motion S four M one two double zero seven. I formally move, Kavina. I now put the question on the motion. The question is that motion S four M one two double zero seven be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed? We are all agreed. The committee will now publish a short report to Parliament setting out our decision on the order. Our next item of business is to take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary on three items of subordinate legislation in relation to the land and buildings transaction tax. I'd like to invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I'll take each of the three uh, land and buildings transaction tax instruments, which are all subject to the negative procedure in turn. Um, firstly, the prescribed proportions order sets out prescribed proportions for two reliefs from LBTT, multiple dwellings relief and acquisition relief. To encourage investment in the private rented sector, Schedule 5 to the LBTT Act provides tax relief for land transactions involving a purchase of multiple dwellings. Relief is provided based on the calculation of the average price of each, of each dwelling being acquired, applying residential rates to of tax to each dwelling, rather than charging the higher rates of tax on the full purchase price of the multiple dwellings. Paragraph 12 of Schedule 5 allows Scottish Ministers to prescribe a minimum proportion of LBTT which must be paid so that the amount of relief is effectively capped. This instrument sets the minimum proportion of LBTT that must be paid where the relief applies. The consultation paper moving forward with land and buildings transaction tax, a consultation on proposed subordinate legislation, published in May 2014, proposed setting a minimum prescribed proportion of 40% of the LBTT that would be payable in the absence of multiple dwellings relief. Eleven respondents opposed the proposal on the basis that it would result in a higher tax liability than under stamp duty land tax. Taking those, the views of those who responded to the consultation into account, I have concluded that an appropriate prescribed proportion for multiple dwellings relief should be 25%. The logic behind this is that under the slab stru tax structure for SDLT, which applied at the time, where the average price per dwelling being acquired fell in the nil rate band, a tax floor was charged at 1% of the whole average purchase price of the dwellings. If the chargeable consideration for the whole transaction exceeded £1 million, as it often would, though not on all cases, in the absence of a relief, tax would have been charged at a rate of 4%. As 1% as a proportion of 4% is equal to 25%, then 25% is, in my view, a comparable prescribed proportion for the relief under LBTT. Part 3 of Schedule 11 to the LBTT Act provides for acquisition relief where a land transaction is entered into by a company for the purpose of or in connection with the transfer of an undertaking or part of an undertaking of another company. The instrument prescribes the proportion of LBTT that must be paid where the transaction qualifies for acquisition relief. Eleven respondents to the consultation paper addressed this question with views divided on the proposed rate of 15% for the prescribed proportion of acquisition relief from LBTT. Under the slab tax structure for SDLT, tax was charged using this relief at 0.5% on the chargeable consideration, which, if the chargeable consideration exceeded a million pounds, tax would otherwise have been charged at 4%. As 0.5% is a, as a proportion of 4% is equal to 12.5%, then 12.5% is a comparable prescribed proportion for the relief under LBTT. The instrument therefore provides for a prescribed proportion for acquisition relief of 12.5%. 
I'll now turn convener to the second order, the Qualifying Public or Educational Bodies Scotland Amendment Order. Paragraph 17 of Schedule 2 to the LBTT Act sets out what counts as chargeable consideration where a public or educational body enters into a sale and leaseback arrangement with another property, a non-qualifying body. Subparagraph 17.2 sets out which public or educational bodies are qualifying bodies for the purposes of paragraph 17. Subparagraph 2c refers to any body listed in Schedule 2 to the, the Further and Higher Education Scotland Act 2005. Subparagraph 3c provides a power to vary the list of qualifying bodies mentioned in paragraph 2. The Post-16 Education Scotland Act 2013 removed institutions from Schedule 2 of the Further and Edu Higher Education Scotland Act 2005, so that should, that should still have the exemption at Schedule 2, paragraph 17.2c applied to them. It is my intention that publicly funded colleges and universities should continue to be in the scope of subparagraph 17.2 of the Schedule to, to the LBTT Act. The LBTT Qualifying Public or Educational Bodies Amendment Order therefore amends the list of qualifying bodies in paragraph 17.2 accordingly. This is therefore a purely technical change to reflect the changes to the higher education landscape following the post-16 Education Scotland Act 2013. Finally, the definition of charity relevant territories regulations makes use of the power in paragraph 15.3d of Schedule 13 to the LBTT Act to add to the list of qualifying territories from which a body registered as a charity may originate and be eligible to claim charities relief, reflecting tax treaties the UK has with other territories. The LBTT consultation paper published on the 1st of May 2014 invited views on a draft of these regulations. There was agreement from the 10 respondents to the Scottish Government's proposal that the Republic of Ireland and the Kingdom of Norway should be added to the list of relevant territories for the purposes of charities relief. One respondent suggested that the Principality of Liechtenstein uh, should be added to the uh, list of relevant territories in order to assist, ensure consistency with changes coming into effect for SDLT under the Taxes Definition of Charity Relevant Territories Amendment Regulations 2014. To keep Scotland's LBTT legislation in line with UK tax treaties, the LBTT Definition of Charity Relevant Territories Regulations add the Republic of I Iceland, the Kingdom of Norway and the Principality of Liechtenstein to the list of relevant territories for the purposes of charities relief. And just for the avoidance of doubt, convener, um, I may have inadvertently referred to the Republic of Ireland, uh, but I did mean the Republic of Iceland earlier on. Swoop on that very point, actually, Cabinet Secretary. I thought I would get in there before yes. you, convener. Wise. Do you have any questions from members? I have none myself. Um, Gavin. Um, Cabinet Secretary, in relation to the first uh, order, uh, SSI 2014-350, um, the policy note says right at the end, um, impact assessments, um, government's approach to the prescribed proportions for multiple dwellings relief and acquisition relief broadly mirrors the current approach for SDLT. I'm just wondering, in terms of timing, is is that referring to the previous approach to SDLT, or is it has it taken into account uh, the autumn statement? Um, I'm just looking to see what what the position is. If if it's the if it's the latter, then fine. If it's the former, then is there any is there any reworking needed in order to to do that? It it, it will apply to, to to both because we're applying a mechanism here, so it's not an absolute number; it's a mechanism. So that would it would deal with uh, all circumstances. Okay, but you, your statement then that it, it broadly mirrors the current approach to SDLT would, would stand then? As, as a, a, essentially, by describing what I'm proposing here as a mechanism. Yeah. Okay. All right. Anything else? Malcolm? Oh, sorry, Jean, then Malcolm. Um, just on, on, on the same order, I, I may be wrong about this, but it seems that I remember when we were discussing uh, the the, the change that we would changes that we would make uh, with the new legislation, uh, cabinet secretary, that this was one area of where I think I'm right in saying that there were that that was uh, vulnerable in the in the uh, re legislation that we were changing in terms of tax loopholes, and that we were determined to be as as you know make our legislation as 
as tight as it could. Are you are you content that we're not making this more vulnerable by uh, changing the legislation in, in terms of the multiple uh, dwellings? I think the the um, I, I, the sentiment that Jean Urquhart refers to very, very much is my sentiment in approaching this legislation. That to, uh, and, and that's evidenced by uh, two things, really, in how we pursued the legislation. One was by um, the minimisation of reliefs, uh, and th th there will be fewer reliefs in our legislation than are in the current uh, arrangements. And secondly, by the the work that we undertook in the Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Bill, um, which Parliament supported in relation to the establishment <coughs> of a very high threshold of intolerance to tax avoidance through the general anti-avoidance rule, which I think is now, as I look at the commentary about the general anti-avoidance rule, it is now attracting the commentary that I hoped it would attract, which is basically this is a pretty high bar and a very intolerant uh, approach been taken in Scotland. So. I'm pleased that the tax commentary is now reflecting that intent in our legislation. Although we reduced the number of reliefs, we didn't eliminate reliefs altogether because reliefs have a legitimate part within a tax system. And I'm confident that the arrangements that I put in place here are consistent with that, uh, that approach. You gave a kind of mat a mathematical, logical explanation for changing from 40% to 25%, but I wonder whether you thought it would have any uh, impact on future private housing investment. Was that a relevant factor, and do you think that is it significant that there's a change from 40 to 25 in that regard? Yeah, I, th I think that I think that concern that was been. It's interesting that Mr Chisholm highlighted my mathematical logic, logicality on 25%. Uh, I, I, I don't suppose I could say that 40% was graced by mathematical logic, so at least we got there in the end. Um, I think the, the point that was made by the, by the respondents was, I think, the point that Mr Chisholm makes, that at 40% that, would have been, that may well have had an impact on multiple dwellings. So I, I, I hope by the actions I've taken, uh, I've addressed that issue. And I think it says it will not be available to private landlords, and I quote, who acquire properties in a piecemeal fashion. What, what does that mean in practice? Um, it essentially means that we are, this, this is an approach that we are taking on um, the development of, um, I, I suppose, a project development, if I could describe it in that fashion, which is a, a cumulative project development in a particular site where there is the opportunity to... Um, a, to uh, un undertake a, a particular piece of work that creates a range of properties that would then be available for um, uh, onward transaction, as opposed to um, a private landlord applying uh, for this type of relief here, there and everywhere, if, I, if, I, if, if that makes the distinction. Okay. Neil, do you want to say something? Just, um, I think what Mr Sweeney said is absolutely correct. It's, it's, it's where the, the landlord is acquiring multiple dwellings in one transaction, one go, essentially, um, whereas uh, the piecemeal approach would be to buy them one at a time. And so this, uh, this relief would not apply to a landlord buying properties one at a time with a view to building up a portfolio. It's but where they acquire eight or ten properties or 50 properties in one go, then the relief would apply there. So it's to encourage the investment in the private rented sector as the Cabinet Secretary said at the outset. OK. Well, that has exhausted your questions from members. I'd like to uh, thank the witnesses today and uh, just have a 30-second break where we allow um, the Cabinet Secretary and his colleagues to leave. Thank you. Our next item of business is to consider the negative instruments on which we have just heard evidence. I'd like to invite any comments from members. Uh, we have uh, no comment uh, from any members. Um, 
uh, at the start of the meeting, the committee agreed to take the next item in private. I therefore would like to close the public part of the meeting, so I'll suspend for 30 seconds to allow the public and official report to leave. <laughs>